Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging around to listen to the last lecture of this amazing weekend. I'm assuming it's amazing because I haven't been there. So, which is a little odd when Carrie asked me if I could do the closing lecture. I was really happy to do it, but I thought, how am I going to know when I haven't actually experienced the entire lecture? I haven't been there. I don't even know what everyone was lecturing about. So while I sat with that, I had to sort of put my money where my mouth is when it comes to energy and connection and sat with it for a while and knowing Carrie and knowing a lot of you just through social media and following, I knew that I would be able to tap into the feeling and the energy of what was going on. So when she asked me if I could do a closing talk, I thought, what am I going to talk about? And as I sat and thought about it, I felt like I wanted to bridge everything together and maybe give you guys a little bit of an insight of my life from that perspective of what I call understanding. And when we're so attached and love so deeply our animals, we can come from a place of fear a lot of times or making decisions that we feel aren't the correct ones. And I think what I'd like to do is I want to try and help you take everything that you learned this weekend and if I can just bring it down and help you bring it all together synergistically where it's, it's not just tangible, but it becomes energetic. So I decided to do the lecture on something called knowledge, wisdom, connection, and understanding. And that's my hope, is when we're finished today, that everything that you heard today, we can just bridge that, all of that amazing, that amazing information, wisdom, and knowledge, so that you can leave with a really strong understanding. So thank you, Carrie. I wish I was there so I could hug all you guys and, and be close to you, but this is the next best thing. So one of the phrases that I use a lot is that we're drowning in information, but we're starving for understanding. And what that means to me is that I'm a scientist. I'm a complete research nerd. I have been in practice at my hospitals for more than 25 years. I was in conventional medicine for longer than that. So that knowledge and that information that we get through science is incredible. And it's really important and it helps us to form our information and our, and our understanding, but it's not that. And I feel like it's brought to the world of holistic medicine or natural medicine or natural healing, a lot of solidifying where if someone is, needs that science base, they can feel more comfortable in it from a perspective of the microbiome, which is one of my specialties, it has been hugely important and really, really helpful in bridging that gap between something that we've known for a very long time and something that is truly peer-reviewed and science-based to make people feel more comfortable. Another thing that I say is that the most primal yet most critical contributors to global health and the health of this planet 
as bacterial organisms. Their collaborative power to sustain longevity is unparalleled to anything humanity has ever known. That sounds intense because it is. Because for the longest time, we always felt like bacteria was our enemy. And what we've realized and what I'm realizing even more and more studying bacteria is it's far from our enemy. And the science is showing us that in fact, that's true, but it's still, for me, we're on a slippery slope. When we use science to justify our wisdom, we can be in a place that is outside of what wisdom is all about. Science is there for us to feel more confident and to be able to support people that have the philosophies that things have to be science-based. But what I'm realizing more and more as a scientist and as someone that um, spends a lot of time with my business in nature is that if we go too far to that one side, we're going to actually lose the wisdom that comes along with it. So what is wisdom? This is a Zen garden, and I'm not even going to pronounce this second name <laughs> because I think I'm going to do it wrong. But it has been passed down through generations and our ancestors or your ancestors or who's ever ancestors to create a meditative calming space in order to connect to the wisdom that's out there. Another example of this is the ocean and the moon phases. I personally, I live on the ocean and where I live it has been a tradition for a really, really long time to plant and harvest and grow crops with the tides and with the moon phases. Then Western culture came into effect and productivity and mechanisms and mechanical intervention and sterilization of food and sterilization of the soil became the thing to do. The science-backed way to grow and harvest and plant our food. But then in the last 10 years, probably 20, we've realized that that situation is not very healthy. And that by doing that, we've removed some of the most important things that give ourselves and our animals health to thrive. And that is, it's become void of not just the vitamins, the minerals, but it's become void of the bacteria. And what the bacteria does is it actually not only gives the, the energy and the wisdom to the food, but by ingesting it, it gives the, bac the bacteria actually gives that energy and wisdom to our gut microbiome in order to be able to even convert that food into nutrients. So a lot of people are going back to wisdom and not just staying s stuck or in that science box. When it comes to herbs and it comes to what we're planting, this is, uh, this is something that I learned very young from my grandmother that I am exploring more and more. And that is my grandmother used to plant um, chamomile plants between other herbs and between vegetables and things like that amongst other lots of other ones but i'm using the one chamomile because i'm sure most of you understand and know that plant so when i said to her grandma why 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 do you do that 
She said, because this plant supports and soothes the other plants as a community or as a family, because growing in nature and drought and sun and heat and harvesting can be traumatic. So she was taught by her grandmother, because her mother died very young, to make sure that we call it now companion planting. And the companion planting gives way to something that my grandmother knew a long time ago. And I subscribed to, very young, which is called plant intelligence. And we know now through science, which is amazing, this is where I'm saying, where it becomes integrative and it works incredibly well, has proven that plants have intelligence, has proven that the mycelium of a mushroom goes from a mother tree, and the mother tree tells the mycelium which tree can, it can go to in a forest to give the type of nutrient that it actually needs to give. The communication, the connection, that wisdom happens constantly, day after day. So how do we, how do we acquire that wisdom? Well, we acquire it through our ancestors. We acquire it through downloading information. We even acquire it through the microbiome of our, of our mother and our, and our ancestors because gut bacteria communicates to the heart, it communicates to the brain, and it creates intelligence. So though we have the science to back it now, it's been used and it's been proven to work, and it's been this incredible downloading of knowledge and information and education that that equals wisdom. We all know about acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. It's some, been around for centuries and centuries. It's a modality of medicine that has been treating successfully billions of people. But because even the herbs are based in energy, they're based in thousands and thousands of years of wisdom that has been passed through, through writings for sure, but all through, also through that energetic value of faith, the energetic value of seeing it firsthand. And the herbs themselves signal, um, stimulate the, the chi, in the, or people look at them as meridians, or in homeopathy, it's called the vital force. So they started doing research on acupuncture, and sure enough, they've been able to prove that these needles, um, I always like saying speak to, because it's not, it's not very scientific, but it is what it, it truly is what it's doing. It's, it is engaging with the synopsis, with the neurological system, it can do incredible things. But how does it engage? What does it actually do? It's not just something that is physical. It is definitely energetic. When I decided that I was going to uh, produce medicinal mushrooms, I was, I've been working with medicinal mushrooms for 25 years with cancer patients and autoimmune diseases. And the reason that I did it was because a lot of people back then were using something called shark cartilage. This is just a little story that I'm going off on. And uh, I couldn't use it. People would come to my clinic and go, Julie, have you heard about shark cartilage? I've heard it's been doing this incredible, incredible stuff with cancer. And of course I'd heard of it, but I absolutely refused to use it because I couldn't basically torture another living being to support the health of another. So I had to decide what was I going to do? What was I going to what was I going to use in place of that? So I really dug into 
uh, medicinal mushrooms. And I trained with a traditional Chinese medicine doctor from China. And it was unbelievable is that's that's a pale that's a pale explanation of of what I actually learned and found and when it came time to producing these mushrooms from with my with my company I couldn't get my head around growing these mushrooms in a sterilized situation inside and not to say that it's wrong, and I think the wisdom of mushrooms persevere through basically any kind of growing. So this is not to say one is better or one is worse. This is something to try and even explain more about my understanding of wisdom. So I decided to buy 100 acres of a forest, and part of it has been clear cut, part of it is really old growth. And I decided to grow these mushrooms with my crew in this forest and allow the mushrooms to actually teach us. So not take the mushrooms and go, this is how we have to inoculate the logs and this is what we do here and this is what we do there. It's like, no, we're not doing that. We are going to take these mushroom spores and we are going to put them in all different kinds of places, all different kinds of ways and we are going to sit, watch, wait, record and feel what these mushrooms in the forest and the bacteria and the animals and everything in nature is teaching us. And from that, we've learned so much. And I'm not gonna get into it any longer, but when you're in the forest, it is full of knowledge and the wisdom within the forest is there for everyone. It's not there for scientists, it's not there for veterinarians, it's not there for doctors, it's not there for scholars, it is there for everyone. And Mother Nature is probably the most brilliant, giving, incredible teacher on the planet because all she wants to do is share, share her gifts, share her wealth, help to support every single species in this on this planet so if you want to get educated and if you really want to understand and if you want to download information what better place to go than where it comes from where it's actually being created and to me a forest or the ocean is one of the best places to go so this next slide is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, this quote is by Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, who was the founder of homeopathy, and it says, above all, do no harm. And in my clinics, I had five veterinary hospitals, integrated veterinary hospitals, and over every single reception counter was this saying. And the reason that that was there wasn't just for me. It wasn't just for doctors, you know, in, in remembrance of Dr. Hahnemann. It was there to spark an interest in what that actually meant. For me, it means, it meant that every day I walked through that door, above all, do no harm meant Above all, do no harm to my patients. What was I going to do where I stayed at the forefront to be sure, 100% sure, that whatever I did was not going to cause harm? Not to do harm to my clients, the pet parents of those patients. Because we can easily fall into this trap that we know everything. And for me, that's harmful. Because every single person client that walked through my door, every single solitary person that sat across my desk was there because of how much they loved their animal. So to even remotely hint that maybe they could have done something better, that they didn't make the right decisions, how could it, to me, that was doing harm. 
another thing was to, to, to use supplements and to use things from a natural perspective that absolutely did no harm to the planet. To source every single thing with such integrity to be sure that I wasn't doing anything that took from nature but more that, that I could actually give back to, to something that was helping thousands and thousands and thousands of animals that I, that I saw heal, thrive, you know, live out their lives in a more comfortable way. So that, above all, do no harm. So it was a really high level understanding of what it meant every single time I walked through the door. But I also wanted to try and teach that to my clients. And how I did that was with intention and understanding. And what that means is that, sure, they came to me and to all my veterinarians in all my practices for knowledge and information. And we did our best to provide that to them. But one thing that I always did and still do is that I always would say to them how smart that they were, how intuitively they knew their animals better than I did, better than any vet did, better than anybody. And how were they going to do that? How, how, how were they gonna sit across from me and ask me as many questions as they wanted to and not feel bad or second guess me? or second guess one of, the, one of the other veterinarians, or you know, dig in as much as they wanted to do. I encouraged that as much as I possibly could. And the reason that I did that is because for me, understanding and intention is, is very similar. So when we think about intention, I can, one thing I can guarantee everybody is that when your intention comes from love, none of us have a crystal ball, nobody has the perfect plan. You can do fully 100% conventional medicine, do surgeries, do every diagnostic on the planet, and I would not be able to tell you what that outcome's gonna be. You could do fully holistic, and I can't tell you what that outcome's gonna be. You could do an integrative approach, and I can't tell you what that outcome is gonna be. But what I can tell you is if you sit down and you have that intention that comes from your heart, and you sit with how you want your animals to live, and what is your philosophy, and what from your heart without fear, because that's a big one, what is coming from your heart without any fear, if you make your decisions based on that and the outcome, you're gonna give your animal the best gift you could possibly give them because animals thrive on love. And it's why we love them so much because they have unconditional love. The love that they give to us is unparalleled by anything. So when you're making your decisions from your intention, what I would say to people is sit and get grounded in your philosophy, not what you think your philosophy should be. Not your philosophy, oh, I need to be fully holistic, or I need to do this, or I do, it doesn't matter. What is in your soul and in your heart that is your philosophy? That when you make those decisions, even if the outcome isn't what you want, it came from your heart and it came from this deeply grounded space where there won't be guilt. Guilt usually comes from making decisions out of fear. More people than you can imagine sat across from me and had said to me, I wish I had known this, or I wish I had done this, or I wouldn't have done this if I had known this. So the understanding piece of all of this is that you get the knowledge, you get the information, and then you sit with it so that you understand it. If you're asked to give a drug and you don't ask questions, how are you gonna understand the high level situation that could happen? If you find out what the side effects are of that drug or that surgery, and then you weigh it 
based on what your heart is saying, it won't matter what you're doing. If you, can do the, if you do the drugs or you don't do the drugs, it is still coming from that place that you understood your decision from a place that is tapped into many different things and not just information. When you're around your animals, what I always would say to people is don't just hear information, but understand the information. So part of the way of doing that for me personally is by paying attention, by being in the moment, by understanding what do animals really want. So to understand what makes them happy, what makes them content, what makes them feel safe, watch so that you know and you can see and understand when that connection happens. Because as humans, we can go off on a tangent of what makes us happy or what makes us feel good. Animals are much more basic from a perspective of they want to feel safe. They want to feel loved. They want to feel connected. Providing them with their, their basic needs, in my opinion, is more important than anything. Because again, we don't know which path if we take it, what's gonna happen. But if your animal is feeling that way, content, happy, protected, loved, you need, to, un you need to, to know those subtle changes so that when you're looking at them, you can go, something's up, he's not happy. Or, oh my God, look at him, like he's just like so happy. I, I think I said once to my marketing team, we had a, it was spoil your pet day. And I have a big supplement company, so our natural thing for marketing would be, oh, you know, spoil your pet day by, or your pet day, so, you know, a percentage off our, our products. And I said, really? That wouldn't be how I would spoil my pet. <laughs> I would be like, what does my pet want to be spoiled? Does it want me to take it to the pet store and buy it a shiny new collar? Does it want me to post a million pictures of it on Facebook? Does it want, what does it want? All my animals would want me on the floor, rolling around with them, getting in the dirt, going for walks, being brushed, being cuddled. I mean, there's a gazillion things that my, my animals would feel they were being spoiled without purchasing something. So, it's understanding them on their level, understanding them not on a humanized level, but understanding them in their species level. So a while ago, my instincts told me that we needed to stop putting nature in a box, and instead we needed to start promoting a movement of moving back into Mother Nature's classroom and learn what she's saying and teaching us. And I think that is a way of understanding because, like I said, we're bombarded with information and knowledge, but we really don't even get what understanding means. Understanding in nature, you can't, you can't go out in nature and really be present and watch and not understand what it's telling you. It's, it's consuming if you allow it to be. So the more I researched gut health and the microbiome and the fascinating world of bacteria, medicinal mushrooms, forests, the connection and the communication that nature has within the forest beds, the more my understanding becomes solidified with the word diversity. And diversity is paramount in anything. It's paramount in health. So if you're feeling like the diversity is to have some conventional diagnostics and maybe surgery and maybe homeopathy and maybe acupuncture and maybe, it's like you don't have to choose one thing. There's no right or there's no wrong. There is just 
moving through your animal's health in this amazing world that you live in with it through flow and connection and understanding. So we all hold the power to make final decisions to advocate for our animals, our family, ourselves, and our planet. And that is something that I am positive you guys learned this, this weekend. And that is something that is, is not something that we're taught every day, that we hold the power for our own health, or our own health, or our planet's health, or our animal's health, or our family's health. And it's something that is a really important piece to walk away from this, this weekend. And the more you understand, the more your intention is grounded within you, the more it comes from a place of love, the more powerful you will be. So underneath it all, they know it's coming from love. And again, I've seen, I've been part, I've been honored to be part of thousands of animals euthanasia, whether that was a medical euthanasia or support with homeopathy that they died at home. And I can, I can honestly say that not one of them has, have I experienced in my, in my practices where that intention wasn't there and that that animal wasn't comforted in, in, in that intention and in that love. And they 100% knew. So connection. Surround yourself with like-minded hearts. I read a little saying from Rumi the other day that to light, or something like to light the, to light the flame of your life, surround yourself with people that have a spark or something. It's something like that. I can't even remember it, but I thought it's so true. Like our passion, our 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 love for nature, our love for our animals, our love for our planet, our love for each other needs to be supported by people that 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 spark that flame, that spark that love. So that's exactly what you've just done. And this is exactly what Carrie is trying to do. She's trying to to physically connect people that have heart connections, that have that have no judgment that support each other in their individuality at the same time as a collective energy of bettering animals, bettering um, the health of animals, bettering our planet, being more empathetic, being more understanding, and embracing the knowledge and the wisdom of, of all of these modalities, uh, conventionally and otherwise. So when you're with your animals, to get that connection, take the time to truly connect with your animals. And what I say is that, you know, the internet and um, connection through FaceTime and Instagram and reading blogs and getting research is amazing. And it has given us so much and it's connected us for sure. But I also feel that it has completely disconnected us. And when it comes to your animals, my number one thing is to say, is to disconnect and connect with them. Be with them, make space for them, be in the moment with them, and don't even have anything, if you can help it, cell phone-ish wise with you, let alone taking pictures and posting them on Instagram while you're trying to engage with your animal. It's not what they want, and it's not something that is going to help you connect. So 100% disconnect to connect when, when we're dealing with animals. Connection, so dopamine and oxytocin is something that comes from, I've been lecturing this for this on this for about 10 years, through the gaze, and um, I remember at my hospital, that gaze was only supposed to be between a mother and a child, or between two intimate 
uh, monogamous partners. And I knew that that wasn't true because I'd, I haven't been a mother, but I know I've felt that feeling with my animals many, many times. And then I think it was 2012, a Japanese study came out to prove that that pituitary oxytocin loop actually did happen with the, with the gaze of, of a dog. And now more and more research is showing it's a gaze of anything that you love. So whether that be a horse, a cat, a gerbil, a chicken, it doesn't really matter. That eye connection, and you can see that in this, in this, uh, in this slide. And that, when we talk about energy understanding, in that moment, nobody's teaching you or, or helping you understand that information. In that moment, that wisdom and that connection and that surge of hormones is, just happens. It's, it's a, it's a phenomena that's in our bodies, in my opinion, to create health, to continue thriving, because we've proven through science, peer-reviewed studies, that oxytocin can help fight cancer, can help prevent cancer, can decrease anxiety and, and uh, depression. So this hormone, which is free, is just based on love and being not distracted or else you can't do it. Being in the moment and connecting with a loved one and then everybody out here sitting and watching this, that loved one is definitely our animals. So connection with our veterinarian, and I'm sure you guys heard tons and tons and tons about this this weekend, but I particularly like this slide because of the circle goes into the heart of the woman and the heart over the dog. And then the, for me, him having his hand reaching out is this olive branch of knowledge. And I have been in this industry for a long time and I have, you know, I started volunteering at vet clinics when I was 14 years old. And some of my very best favorite people on the planet are veterinarians and you know they're getting a really hardcore rap and I understand why but I think to shift that perspective of it not being the person but possibly the industry and how difficult it must be for them in this day and age in in and what's put on to them to to do and to um, achieve is astronomical. So part of, for me, working with your vet is when you go through that door, do your homework, find your intention, feel what you want to happen before you walk in that door. Come through that door with that intention of above all do no harm, which is also not judging your vet. It's also giving yourself a break that you know as much as he does or she does, it's just different. It's, it's, it's aligning the wisdom, the in intuition, and the love of your animal that you have been born with. And ancestors have passed down to you. We just haven't had that moment to understand that and connect the dots. But when you do and you walk through that door, that should be that, a synergistic connection where you're getting the knowledge and the information and then the wisdom, intuition, and understanding that, that you have produces this incredible result for, for, for your animal. And that has to come from a place of practicing. And I would suggest that you practice that a lot because when there's an emergency and you're flying through that door, freaking out wouldn't fear. I don't know how many people meditate, but it's like when you've meditated on something long enough, you can stand in it no matter how scared you are. With a few breaths, you can you, you tap into that again. The same thing will happen with your, with your intention of always what you want to do from a health perspective with your pet, without a doubt. So you just come in, you're freaking out, 
every available moment that you can, you tap into that stuff that you've been practicing. So this picture, again, is just that, that connection. Now, I want to try to bring this all together in these next few slides. And how I'm going to do that is with horses. And I know that not a lot of people out there have horses, but I have a very large horse rescue farm. And I want to just tell you a little fast story about when I know that understanding, connection, wisdom, and knowledge has been regained in these horses. So the horses that I have, they don't come to my farm unless they have PTSD, so post-traumatic trauma. And um, when they come, they're usually really dangerous. And they're usually really dangerous to themselves and to people. And they're a couple of days away if not moments away, from being euthanized, shot, or sent to slaughter. They're in pretty rough shape, and horses, unlike our dogs and cats, are animals that are preyed upon, so they're eaten. And our dogs and cats are prey animals. So horses have this very strong, intuitive nature of that 100% is tapped into through their ancestors because they learn by they learn by doing things they learn by falling off a cliff or they will learn by stepping on a snake or they learn by running into a tree well if every single horse had to do that <laughs> to learn we wouldn't have the evolution of horses so somehow that that understanding and that knowledge gets tapped into when they're born and by being with their mother and learning and watching. But when they come to my farm, the majority of that's gone. And they are running into walls and they are in this place of fight or flight. So horses, they graze and then they hear a noise and they instantly go into fight or flight. So they look, they assess the situation, whether that noise in the forest was a tree branch just breaking off from the wind or was a, a mountain lion that was going to come and jump on their back and eat them. And within those brief seconds through senses, through smells, through sight, through their very large energy sphere, they decide what they're going to do. They're either going to run, they're going to fight, or they're going to go back to grazing. And now, there are lots of psychiatric therapies where they use that idea to go back to grazing often with horses where you assess, you figure out your safe space, and then you go back to grazing. The horses, when I get them, can't do that. They don't even, <clears throat> they're in a space where they don't even know what they're doing. So what I do, is I take them and I put them back in nature. And I mean I put them back in nature. No one handles them but me initially because they're very dangerous. And they are provided safe shelter, um, you know, shade, warmth, food, water, and safety. And I am gonna speed this up a bit, but I can't even tell you what it's like when you start to watch all of that wisdom and understanding come back. When they start moving their ears and you know, okay, they're, they're, they're starting to settle where they can actually hear things, where they get scared and then they go back to grazing and that eventually they can be put in with the rest of the herd and they can be handled. But while that's happening, it is phenomenal to watch because there is no doubt in my, my intellectual brain, <laughs> my heart, or my belief that nature isn't talking to them. That wisdom that is all around us 
plant, whether it's even, sometimes I think, is it, is it the plants that they're eating? Is the wisdom also coming from the different plants and the different herbs that are out in the fields and the grasses and the trees and the wind and the, the eagles and whatever they're around? Are they all communicating with each other? Are they downloading information, understanding and wisdom? And I would bet, even as a scientist, that, that's, that that is more true than them just learning to relax. So we are all here, and when I say we, I mean me, and all of these incredibly gifted, amazing people that openly shared with you their experiences and their information this weekend. We're so also very, very lucky. We're here to guide you and light the path to what fits best in your life, what fits best to your soul, and because that soul is connected with your animal. So hopefully when you leave today, you can spend some time in nature, spend some time with your animals, and you can find that individualized perspective in understanding that comes from a place that none of us up here, scientists, doctors, can even say for sure where it's coming from. But that you start to connect those dots and you start to feel stronger and stronger and closer and closer to that wisdom, the knowledge, the information, and a deep, deep understanding that will help you on your path, no matter what you choose. So thank you so much, Carrie, for asking me. And I am thrilled that I'm even able to stand here and somehow connect with you. I hope that that happened. And have an amazing rest of your weekend. And I wish I was there that I could hug everybody and you know, just be part of it. But truly, I feel in the last week that that I am. And I just want to say thank you. And thank you for supporting a change that needs to happen. And without you guys, it could never we could never do it. Thank you.